Hello, today's lecture is going to be on chapter 12, nursing management during pregnancy. So some of the risk factors that we see for um, pregnancy is based on things that we put into the body. Um, uh, we or conditions that are already there before um, the pregnancy happens. So I mentioned before in previous lectures that the placenta is pretty good about keeping some things out, but there are certain things that it does not keep out. And here are some of those. So for instance, um, Accutane, which is a, a drug that is commonly used for acne, um, is one of the pregnancy X categories, meaning that if we take this during pregnancy, we know for sure, for sure, it's a teratogen and it's going to cause um, uh, 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 defects in the fetus, especially if taken in those early developing months. So um, alcohol misuse, certain anti-epileptic drugs, which can become concerning if a mom um, does have a seizure disorder and needs to be on these medications. There are some that they can move to, but um, uh, you know, if they're used to taking a specific med and it's controlling their condition very well, and then they have to stop taking that medication and move to something else, they might actually start having some seizures. So diabetes, uh, preconcept preconception, meaning they have diabetes before they get pregnant, that is going to affect um, the pregnancy. A folic acid deficiency, uh, there are certain conditions that decrease the ability to absorb folic acid. And so if we have a deficiency, then um, we might have an increase in neural tube issues. HIV or AIDS and obesity. In fact, obesity is becoming fast becoming one of the biggest issues that we see in um, pregnancy. It causes, um, it contributes to a lot of our other maternal health conditions. Some other risks could be hypothyroidism, maternal fetal ketonuria, uh, rubella seronegativity, meaning if they are not immune to rubella and they have the potential of um, contracting the infection. Rubella, German measles, is, the, um, is an infection that does pass through the placenta and gets to the baby and can, can, can cause severe birth defects and or fetal death. Uh, oral anticoag anticoagulants could affect the pregnancy, any sexually transmitted diseases, and then smoking. Believe it or not, there was a time when uh, physicians would actually recommend smoking to mothers when they um, were pregnant because it causes low birth weight. It, it causes um, uh, vasoconstriction and then the uh, baby doesn't get as much through the placenta and it causes these babies to be smaller. And there was a time a while back that physicians actually recommended smoking to mothers so that their babies would be smaller so they would come out easier. Obviously, that's not the way it is anymore. So the period of greatest sensitivity is those is that early few days. So up to 55 days of, um, of gestation is when all the foundation for the um, uh, major organs and the development of that fetus is happening. So um, this is usually a time that many women don't even know they're pregnant, and so what we recommend is if someone is thinking of becoming pregnant or trying or not using birth control, then they need to live their life as if they were pregnant. So that means um, no smoking, no drinking, no uh, drug use, including the use of marijuana. That's a hot topic in um, the prenatal world right now because, quote, it's legal, so it must be okay. But that's not the way it is with um uh, fetuses. These babies, it looks, there's a lot of research coming out that um, the maternal use of marijuana is definitely affecting the um, brain development of these fetuses. So one of the things that we do on our first prenatal visit when um, women are coming to us to, to determine if they're pregnant or they think they're pregnant or they um, uh, know that they're pregnant and they're starting to establish care, one of the, the real reasons for this first prenatal visit is to get an overall idea of how healthy she is to begin with, 
what education she has and what education she needs and to establish that trusting relationship. Um, we're looking for any uh, uh, detection of any specific problem, something maybe that runs in her family, something that's uh, off with the pregnancy. And then we wanna talk about the prevention of potential problems. So a comprehensive health history, a physical exam and lab tests are done on that first prenatal visit. So a lot of women come in because they're suspicious that they're pregnant or they have taken a pregnancy test and they need confirmation. Um, Hopefully that she knows the date of her last menstrual period. That's one of the, the tools that we use, whatever signs and symptoms she may be using. And then uh, most physicians' offices will use a blood test for human chorionic gonadotropin, HCG. That's the um, hormone that is produced during pregnancy. We're looking for her past medical, surgical, and personal history and her reproductive history. If she's ever been pregnant, if she's had any miscarriages or abortions, if she's had any gynecological history, any sexually transmitted infection history, any history of problems in the family, any genetic problems. So the first prenatal visit is usually the longest. So when we're looking at her menstrual history, the things that we're looking at, when did she start having her period, how many days in her cycle, uh, any specific flow characteristics, if she used contraception in the past. One of the ways, one of the tools that we can use is called Nagel's rule. Uh, this is a way of looking at where or what her last menstrual period was and estimating the date of birth. This is a um, hot topic that we see in uh, labor and delivery and, and it, it, people come up with this due date and they think it's an, a contract. And so when we are estimating a due date, Kind of interesting if you look into it a little bit further. Um, women grow babies longer at different periods of the year, so different seasons they're going to be pregnant. Different families grow babies longer or shorter periods of time. So when we say that it's a due date, it's actually just a, a, a um, calculator, a month, a, a guess of which month the baby's going to be in, but we get really caught up in this date. So one of the ways that we can, that's why we call it an estimated due date or an expected date of birth. So you'll see EDC or EDD, expected date of delivery. Um, Nagel's rule is using the first day of the last menstrual period. So we'll say that's 112107. And then you subtract three months from that. So now we're to 82107. And then you add seven days, 82807, and add one year, 82808. So that is the expected date of birth or expected date of delivery. So this is a down and dirty way of, of figuring out when the expected due date is. And you will need to know Nagel's rule. NCLEX loves this question. Um, in reality, we use things like a gestational wheel or a birth calculator. I have a picture of that on the next slide. And here's a very important fact is that early ultrasound is the best method of dating in pregnancy. Late ultrasound does not do what an early ultrasound does because early on, all fetuses are about the same, about the same size, about the same, um, they have about the same measurements at the same gestation. But you know, there's a lot of variation in humans. And so as we get further on in the pregnancy, those uh, uh, similarities change. So if we were to do a late ultrasound on someone, it's a little bit harder to predict how what the gestation is based on size, because as we know, um, we are all very different. So a uh, really great test question. Early ultrasound is the best method of dating in pregnancy. But Nagel's rule is something that you need to know. So um, first day of the last menstrual period, subtract three months, add seven days, and then change the year, and you have come up with the due date. Again, it's an estimate date, it's a due month. So due date calculators on your phone, most labor and delivery nurses have them, or you can use a wheel. And the way this wheel works is you put this little arrow on the first day of the last menstrual period, and then you hold it there and come over here, and it, even here it says approximate date of delivery, this is the 40th week. But it's a way of knowing how many weeks someone is. Um, you, you see these used in the ER quite a bit because let's say that it's March, you can figure out that she's um, 
about 23 weeks pregnant. So that we do pregnancy in weeks when we are um, uh, in the medical field rather than in months. So there's some terms that we want to become familiar with. Gravida is um, a, a pregnancy, a pregnant woman. Uh, Gravida one means it's her first pregnancy. So Gravida two, Gravida three, Gravida four. And you'll usually see it written as G1, P0, or G2, P1. So what that means, Gravida is how many times they've been pregnant, and Para is how many times they've delivered a baby that um, uh, 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 delivered a viable baby or carried a pregnancy 20 weeks or more. So um, if I'm a Gravita 2 para 1, I've been pregnant twice and then I've delivered one baby. So we need to figure out, are they pregnant now or what happened to that other pregnancy? Some other terms, um, prima para, you'll see us uh, use this term sometimes we abbreviate things so you'll hear the word primip or primy or prime that means that um, she's had one uh, one birth uh, uh, this is one birth after a pregnancy of at least 20 weeks primip so that's the first time she's given birth a multipara is with someone that's had two or more pregnancies and a nullipara is someone that has had no pregnancies or no viable offspring so you'll hear these terms and you'll see them on your report sheet. You want to become familiar with these. And then there's another way of breaking down how many births someone's had. We call that the GTPAL. So here, gravita, how, uh, how many pregnancies. Term, how many pregnancies have ended after 37 weeks. P is for preterm births. So the number of preterm pregnancies ending after 20 weeks. A stands for how many abortions or um, miscarriages. And L stands for how many living children. So now we could really break down someone's um, obstetric history by looking at it uh, this way. So if someone comes in and says, I'm a G4P0, we need to figure out were they miscarriages, were they abortions? And um, as, I'll just remind you that when we use the term abortion, it just means a pregnancy that did not continue. It doesn't necessarily mean the kind that you choose to have, or it, uh, abortion is the term for a pregnancy that doesn't continue. But we never use the word abortion when we're talking to a patient because they think it just means the kind that you choose not to continue the pregnancy. But abortion um, is the generic term. So we will use the layman's term miscarriage when talking to a patient. So when we're doing the physical exam, um, we are, of course, are going to get some good vital signs, a head to toe assessment, looking at the abdomen, including a fundal height, if that's appropriate. We want to look at the extremities to see if there's any swelling um, and, and just overall uh, general physical assessment. So here is measuring that fundal height. We go from the symphysis pubis, which is just at the top of that pubic bone. You have to touch it to feel it all the way up to the fundus, which is the top of the uterus. So again, as we measure that fundal height, it can start to tell us about how many weeks. It doesn't work real well until this um, uterus gets out of the pelvis and into the abdomen. So up until about 20 weeks, we can just assume this is a, uh, um, here is a, a, about the first trimester, and then here's the second trimester. And again, this is all going to be, be dependent on um, the woman's BMI. A pelvic examination, usually done by a physician or a midwife, looking to see what type of pelvis shape this woman has. There are four different types, um, gynecoid, platypoid, android, and anthropoid. Our um, uh, desired type is the gynecoid. This is the easiest shape for a baby to fit through. Uh, these other types, there can be births through them, depending on the size of the baby. But these are going to be um, estimated based on the examination um, by the midwife. So uh, there isn't a real way to tell exactly what shape the, the um, pelvis is. When they do an internal examination, they're looking for landmarks, such as these processes on the, on the pelvis. But we hope that it's gynecoid. And we say that a woman has a proven pelvis if she has delivered a baby through that, um, through the pelvis. 
prenatal labs. We'll spend some time talking about this. We will definitely talk about these things again. Um, super important to get these early on. And I always tell women they need a copy of their prenatal labs because it could actually save the baby some um, extra medication administration later if they show up at a hospital and this baby's born and we don't have access to our prenatal records, then these babies have to be treated as if um, we don't know them. So uh, we'll start with the urinalysis and I'll spend more time talking about that in the next slide, but we are going to get a UA. You can tell a lot about a woman from a UA and every prenatal visit after the first one, she, we will collect a UA. We need a blood count to see where her hematocrit and hemoglobin levels are. We wanna make sure that she's not anemic um, early on. We also want to know what her blood type is and what the RH factor is. Super important for us because at 28-ish weeks, if she's RH negative, we're going to be giving her um, administering Rogam. And I'll talk more about this later, but we are hoping to prevent a um, reaction to the baby's blood if the baby has a different um, RH factor. We want to know whether she is immune to rubella or not. So in this circumstance, we are looking for the rubella titer. So we're hoping that it's going to be positive. This is telling us not that she has an active infection, but that she has developed immunity, usually through um, a vaccination. But we want to see that her titer is positive in this situation. Our hepatitis B surface antigen, we want this one to be negative. We don't want her to be positive to hepatitis. So when we're looking for a surface antigen, we're looking to see if she has an active infection. So rubella, we want to be positive because we want her to be immune. But hepatitis, we're hoping not to find an active surface antigen because we don't want her to have an active infection. And then we're looking for HIV status, whether she has... Um, uh, syphilis, and you'll see this listed as RPR. Sometimes you'll see this listed as uh, treponia or trepone treponium. Um, we're looking for her herpes infection to see her VDRL status if she has um, uh, uh, herpes in the blood. And then a cervical smear. We want to know that her pap smear is normal. And so most, and we're also looking for gonorrhea and chlamydia at that point. So uh, overall history of what's going on with her right that moment, um, uh, these prenatal labs are very important. And then that ultrasound we will use for size and dates to, again, estimate her um, due date. So here's that urinalysis I was talking about. We used to do this at the bedside, but now most of the places they are sent to the lab, unless you're in the doctor's office, you will be doing these. And so by dipping this urine, First, you look at the color and quality and clarity of the urine. So I can tell just by looking at this person, she's a little dehydrated because urine should actually be almost colorless, just slightly um, with a yellow tint. So she's a little on the, on the concentrated side. And I've actually done a little experiment before. I should put that picture in the slides, but um, I had a patient that came in severely dehydrated. And of course I had to keep her to hydrate her. And as she kept giving me a urine sample, we lined them up on the counter and she could see just by drinking water, how her urine changed over about a two hour period of time. It was, it was a really good um, educational process for this patient. She didn't realize how important urine, I mean, water actually was to her urine concentration. As we get further along in pregnancy, dehydration can actually cause contractions. They don't um, necessarily, uh, if she's term, she can have lots of contractions, but a dehydrated uterus doesn't work as well, isn't as efficient, so she'll hurt and nothing will be happening with the cervix. But if, if she's preterm, um, we can actually see dehydration contribute to preterm labor and it, potentially preterm labor leads to preterm delivery. So uh, hydration is very important. And I'll just point out here that when I talk about hydration, I'm talking about water. I'm not talking about soda. I'm not talking about coffee, milk, um, juice, tea, energy drinks. None of that is hydration. Hydration is water. Free water is what our body needs for hydration. So back to the urine sample. Um, when you dip this urine, you will obviously be wearing gloves and you will use this stick to hold up to this, oh, sorry, 
um, to hold up to this bottle and then you'll be able to measure what color this is. Uh, these are your norms. And then if you have anything over to this side, each one of these little squares represents something else. So let's go through them very quickly. Leukocytes, and it's a little cut off here, but leukocytes are looking for white blood cells. And if we see a lot of white blood cells in the urine, then we're suspicious for infection, especially if we have nitrates. If we're positive for nitrates, the most common infection that we see that causes nitrates is an E. coli infection. Infection. So E. coli in the urine will produce nitrates and leukocytes, and E. coli comes from the gut. So if this is a woman and you're testing her urine and she has an E. coli infection, you want to have a little education about making sure that she's wiping in the correct direction. So if you're wiping from the back to the front, you increase your chance of um, developing an E. coli infection. And so we need to give some education. Now it is possible to get an E. coli infection down below um, without wiping the wrong way, especially in a woman that's on the more obese side because that E. coli bacteria can find its way over there. But it, it's just a, it just gives you a lot of information. And then of course, we're looking for bilirubin. If she has bilirubin, then we're concerned about her liver function. We're looking for protein, and I'll go more into this in the next couple of weeks as we talk about the problems that develop during pregnancy, but protein is very specific. Um, protein urea is um, indicative and uh, help, uh, leads us to diagnostic if we are um, looking for things like preeclampsia. Uh, the other thing you will see is if you have blood in the urine, you'll have protein because blood um, uh, is protein. So we're looking for our pH that helps to tell us how hydrated the patient is. Our blood, again, if we have traces of blood or large amounts of blood in the urine, we could be concerned maybe about a kidney stone or is there bleeding actually coming from the vagina? So there, um, uh, or, or does she have an infection? Sometimes you'll see blood with an infection, uh, moving into a kidney infection. So we um, specifically want to look at um, our, our blood and then our specific gravity. So earlier I mentioned that pH is going to help us determine our acidity of our urine and looking at hydration. Well, specific gravity is for hydration. So we definitely want it to be, it, it, she, if her specific gravity is a 1.0, if it's anything higher than that, we know that it's more concentrated. And so we want it to be a, a normal. Oops, I did it again. And then ketones. Ketones are, ketone bodies are produced when we are breaking down muscle for energy. So if she's not eating well and not able to take in enough um, uh, carbo carbohydrates, then she's going to start breaking down muscle. And we see this in our women that are um, malnourished from um, having extreme nausea, vomiting, hyperemesis. We'll talk more about that. Um, and then uh, again, looking at our bilirubin and then glucose. If she's spilling sugar, then we start to worry about diabetes. So the urine really points us to look for other problems. It's super important. And it's also a great um, time to be able to educate our patients about her uh, hydration status and the importance of water during um, pregnancy well, all the time. So I'm going to briefly talk about infections here. I'm not going to get too in-depth, but um, I just want to briefly touch on a few of these because they're so important in pregnancy. So cytomegalovirus is actually the most common infection we see. It's one of the most common viruses. In fact, most people are CMV positive. If you happen to be CMV negative as an adult, which is very rare, you are a golden blood donor because the babies that need blood, our NICU babies that, that need blood transfusions, preterm babies, can only have CMV negative blood because we um, don't want to infect them with CMV. So cytomegalovirus, most of us have had it. It's usually um, the symptoms are not very severe, but if we get it while pregnant, they, it, can, it does pass through the placenta and get to the baby. Rubella, I've talked about already, it can certainly cause infections and or um, uh, fetal, uh, it'll interfere with fetal development, can even cause death. Herpes simplex virus, 
is the um, virus that we typically refer to as being on the face, herpes simplex, um, but it, it can also move down into the um, uh, genital regions. And so you can have herpes simplex on the genital re regions. And if a mom is infected with herpes, um, she has to be very careful about vaginal delivery. We typically will put them on some sort of suppressive therapy if she has genital herpes, um, because if a, if a baby were to be born through, through the vagina with an active herpes infection, she would potentially pass that infection on and it gets into the baby's brains and herpes encephalitis, and they don't fare very well. Um, hepatitis B, B virus, if she is actively infected, then we assume that the baby is a very high chance of being um, seroconverting and being infected as well. And we will have to treat these babies a little bit differently after birth. They, instead of holding off on the bath, we want to bathe them right away. They also will receive the hepatitis B vaccine and the hepatitis B immunoglobulin, hoping to prevent them from um, uh, uh, converting into uh, positive status. There are lots of people from other countries that have had a hepatitis B um, vaccine that will show up as positive. So um, you have to make sure you know what you're testing for when you are looking at those um, labs. Varicella chickenpox virus does pass through the placenta. Parvovirus, uh, this is the human variety, does pass through the placenta. I'm going to skip group B strep for just a minute. Toxoplasmosis, typically um, gotten through uh, eating um, infected vegetables or kitty cat litter. And then, of course, HIV. So for HIV, if the mom is infected, she will start her antiviral medication and, and continue it all the way through the pregnancy. And then the baby will actually go on antiviral medication once born. Interestingly enough, we will not be able to tell if the baby actually is infected or not for about the first six to possibly even 18 months, because there will be some residual um, uh, antibodies to HIV in the baby that they received from the mother. So we don't know if those are the baby's own antiviral, um, uh, you know, antibodies, or if it's still uh, residual from the mother. So we won't actually know if the baby's infected for a while. And now I want to go back to group B strep. Group B strep is our um, GBS. It's a, it's a bacteria that lives on the skin. It's a normal flora for a lot of women. But babies that are born to women that are group B strep positive have a higher chance of contracting that through the vagina. So we use some prophylactic antibiotics. The current standard is to use prophylactic antibiotics to um, cut the bacteria level down at birth. So we use these antibiotics during, during um, labor if the mom is positive. We typically will swab down below um, sometime 35, 37 weeks gestation to determine if the mom is group B strep positive. It's not an exact science because she could actually become uh, colonized. There could be an overgrowth of that bacteria after the 35th week. Um, and we may not know it, so then we wouldn't treat her prophylactically. Or it could actually, she could cut down that bacteria growth. So if she was positive at 35 weeks, she may not be positive at the time of delivery. So it's not an exact thing, but the current process right now is to treat everybody that is group B strep positive with antibiotics in labor. So we all know that the more antibiotics we use and put out there, the faster these bugs grow um, the ability to... Uh, um, over, you know, to, to beat our antibiotics to become superbugs and, and become antibiotic resistant. So I don't know that this will be the practice forever, but as of the time of this recording, this is the way it is. So when we are doing a torch screen, um, that stand, it's one of those acronyms that we like to use, we are looking for specific infections. So if a woman is having, has had multiple, um, miscarriages, we start looking for a torch screen to see if maybe she is carrying one of these viruses or if that's possibly what happened. And then there's other reasons that we would do a torch screen um, if something's going on in the pregnancy. So these are looking for toxoplasmosis. The O stands for other infections, including chickenpox, chlamydia, HIV, um, human 
T cell lymphotropic virus and syphilis. R stands for rubella, C stands for cytomegalovirus, and H is for herpes. So toxoplasmosis, as I mentioned before, this typically comes from cats and cat litters. So they recommend that women not change the litter box during pregnancy. And they wanna make sure that they are not eating contaminated meat. So making sure everything is cooked very well and um, washing those fruits and vegetables, especially the ones we get from the farmer's market, we wanna, because it can be passed through there. Women are more susceptible to infection and to contracting viruses during pregnancy. Their immune system is a little bit suppressed. So we want women to be um, super uh, careful about what they're eating. Cytomegalovirus, CMV, uh, as I mentioned, it's a common virus. Most of us are CMV positive, but if we happen to contract the infection during pregnancy, you will see babies that are born with CMV. They typically are smaller weight, usually born preterm. They might have um, difficulties with um, uh, learning, uh, with developmental problems as they um, continue on if they survive it. And they have this blueberry rash, an active CMV, CMV infection is, shows this, this blueberry looking rash. That's kind of what um, CMV is known for. Herpes, as I mentioned before, if a baby is born to a mom that has a herpes infection, um, she, this baby can actually contract herpes and these babies typically don't survive. So if they have congenital uh, herpes infection. This would be a mom that had an active out outbreak during pregnancy and there was a breach in the system or the baby was born um, and this will develop over the first uh, few months of life, but um, babies typically do not do well with a herpes infection. And many women, if they have an active herpes infection at the time of delivery, they will have a C-section instead of um, pushing the baby through the vagina and increasing that chance of infection. Congenital syphilis, this is one of the biggest issues we see in Kern County right now. We actually are testing women because we are a high risk area, meaning we have a large amount of syphilis infections. We're testing women at the beginning of pregnancy during their prenatal labs. We're testing them again in the third trimester, and then we're testing them again on the day of delivery and hoping to prevent these congenital syphilis because these babies also don't do well. And to treat syphilis in the early phase, we'll talk more about this when we do um, our women's health uh, module, but to treat syphilis is a, is a dose of antibiotic. So if we can catch it early, we can avoid all of this congenital syphilis. And these poor babies do not do um, well if they do become infected while in the womb. Zika is another issue that we see in um, our modern day. Uh, it, it's been around for a while, but there's been a lot of um, uh, an increase in the amount of Zika infection. And we used to ask women, every woman that comes in, have you been to a country that has Zika? And um, if you look at the map, the CDC map, it's all in the United States as well. So um, the mosquito has found its way here. Zika, they're figuring out that if a man is infected with Zika, he actually can pass it through the semen. And what we're seeing with these babies, um, Zika virus during pregnancy, these babies are born with something called microcephaly, and that is a, a, an example of it here. And it is brains that just do not develop completely. These babies will um, not be able to um, combat this. This is going to be how they are for the rest of their lives. So if we have a mom um, with Zika virus during pregnancy, we're certainly going to be looking very closely at the head measurement uh, once the baby is born. And then looking here at our babies, let's see this slide, I must have been, uh, oh, GBS, looking at these babies. Um, so as I mentioned before, GBS is our normal flora. And I think I really changed my mind about GBS when I was working in the NICU. So here we have normal, healthy babies born that ha seemingly have no issues. And within just 12 hours, 24 hours, they are looking very septic and becoming very sick. And sometimes it's very hard to um, 
save them. So this is why we're giving women those antibiotics in labor, trying to cut that infection down. It's been pretty much my whole career, last 25, 30 years, we have really been pushing hard to identify women that have GBS colonization and treat them in labor because these were women that went home with their babies and their babies um, just didn't, they would walk in and their babies were gone. Uh, from a, un, you know from a sepsis infection that was just overwhelming very quickly. So I uh, just want to reiterate: this is not a sexually transmitted disease. We do not see uh, these women are not quote infected. They are just colonized, meaning they we are able to grow the GBS bacteria from a swab of their vaginas and rectums and perineal areas. And so we treat them with antibiotics in labor to try to cut down that bacteria load before this baby is born. So neonatal sepsis, there's a couple of things I wanted to um, mention here. Uh, there are some major risk factors for neonatal sepsis. And so um, I will mention these again, but ruptured membranes more than 24 hours. We have now cut down that, that, that um, barrier. It, we've opened that barrier, that sac, that amniotic sac. And if it's been more than 24 hours, we are concerned that bacteria may have gone um, in. So any membrane rupture more than 24 hours, we're going to be looking very closely for neonatal sepsis. Um, if it's been ruptured 12 hours or more, we call that a minor risk factor. And so some providers will actually start some prophylactic antibiotics if there's been a, a membrane rupture for more than 12 hours, 12 to 18. If we have a maternal fever, 100.4 or more, that's a major risk factor. If we have chorioamniitis, chorio has a very distinct foul smell. That's a major risk factor for neonatal sepsis. If the baby, the fetus has a heart rate above 160, we know that's a major risk factor. Um, and then if there's lots of obstetric procedures, amnio infusions, lots of vaginal exams, lots of um, uh, manipulation, uh, internal monitors, then we know we have increased that risk. So for our babies, we need to be on the lookout. As labor and delivery nurses, we need to pass this information on in report to whoever's caring for this mom and baby postpartum. Um, if we are looking at our minor risk factors, I already mentioned membranes ruptured more than 12 hours, a foul smelling, it's not foul smelling liquor, it's foul smelling liquid, a maternal fever of 99.5 or more. If we have low APGAR scores, and we'll know more about APGAR scores um, later as we continue on through the course, um, that's that initial assessment that we do with our uh, babies, if they're premature and if they're multiple. So if we have a presence of one major or two minor risk factors, we are at high risk of sepsis. And again, we need to, as labor and delivery nurses, pass this information on so that um, our, our postpartum nurses and NICU nurses will be on the lookout for these things. The, with babies that, that are septic, um, we have to catch it early. If we don't catch it early, we can't wait for them to get very sick and show us lots of signs. If we don't catch it early, we typically are not going to have a good outcome. Okay. So some of the ways that we can catch this early is looking at abnormal behavior, such as inconsolable crying or listlessness, um, abnormal temperatures, so below 36 or above 38 degrees Celsius. Now we do record temperatures in Celsius and I have given you a temperature conversion chart in your clinic um, tools, but we uh, 37 is normal. And so if it's under 36, babies sometimes don't have the energy level uh, physiologically to create a temperature in, in order to combat illness. So typically our newborns will um, have a low temperature rather than a high temperature. If they're not able to feed or if they can't tolerate feeds, meaning they're throwing up everything. If they have a change in their skin color, they could be mottled or they could be, have a bluish tint or they could be very pale. If they have fast breathing, uh, more than um, uh, 60 breaths a minute and, and it's continuous or if they're grunting or retracting, um, those are usually the first signs that, that we'll see. 
when these babies are not feeling well. And if they're just listless or floppy and have no tone, these are our early signs. And we need to be assuming or watching every baby for these signs every time we come in contact with them so that we can catch it early. So women who are HIV positive, I mentioned this already, but I want to just reiterate um, the, the impact is that the baby will become positive. And so antiviral medications need to um, continue from daily, from 14 weeks until birth. We do IV administration during birth, and then the baby will have oral syrup. Um, and with treatment, we see transmission as low as 1%, which is pretty amazing. And without treatment, it's um, upwards of 35% or more that babies will become positive. So prenatal visits, we're, we're back to that. We did our initial prenatal visit, it was very thorough. And now our follow-up schedule is going to be every four weeks up until about 28 weeks, as long as she is still in the low risk category. If she moves into the high risk category, it's going to be more frequent. And then from 29 weeks to 36 weeks, it's going to be every two weeks. And then from birth to 37 weeks, it'll be every, I mean, from, from 37 weeks to birth, it will be every week. So as she becomes further along her pregnancy, we're going to be watching her more closely and looking for some of those um, signs of some of the conditions that we, can, we need to intervene. So during the follow-up visits, we're going to be looking at her weight, making sure that she's not gaining too closely or too fast. If she is gaining a significant amount of weight, then we have those conversations about what is she eating. And we also want to look for things like edema and swelling because that will cause increased weight gain. We're looking at those blood pressures very closely. Every time she's coming in, we're doing a urine test. We're looking for protein, glucose, ketones, nitrates. You all remember what those are for. Fundal height to make sure that she's matching her gestational weeks. What, um, paying attention to quickening, those fetal movements, talking about kick counts after the 28th week. We want her to be paying very close attention to kick counts because a, a baby that is active is a healthy baby. Listening to the fetal heart rate and then teaching her about danger signs. And I have another slide coming up about danger signs. Leopold's maneuver, I have a great video on the YouTube video list um, about this, but it is basically trying to determine the baby's position based on a, a specific set of maneuvers. We want to know, is the baby head down? Is the baby butt down, breech position? Um, so Leopold's is something that definitely takes some um, practice, and maybe you'll get the opportunity to do that during your clinic visits this week, or, or this term. You you know, just as you're talking to the woman, of course, ask permission before touching her, but then you can just kind of gently place your hands on their abdomen and start feeling for parts. And we will practice this in our clinic skills as well. Other ways that we can assess how the baby is doing during pregnancy, um, I've talked about ultrasound. We typically do an early ultrasound for dates, and then we do a um, uh, ultrasound at about 20 weeks to look for certain structures in the heart, to look for um, uh, what they call an anatomy scan to make sure that um, the baby is developing normally. We can do something called a Doppler flow study. This is looking at the umbilical cord. I don't see these done very often, but it's important to know them because sometimes you'll see these on different tests, um, NCLEX tests and ATI tests. We are doing an alpha feta protein analysis. That's a blood test. That is a, a screening tool to help us look for um, neural tube defects. There's more information in your book, and I want you to spend some time looking at some of these um, tests. There are um, uh, amniocentesis, which is the most invasive of all the tests that we do for our pregnancies, and that is where they actually take some of the amniotic fluid out um, using an ultrasound to make sure that they're in the right area and test this for genetic um, uh, uh, issues. So before when I talked about um, mapping our genome and knowing uh, the different genetic markers, they can actually test for tons of different um, issues. And, and usually the reason this is done is a woman is concerned or carries something in her family or maybe is advanced maternal age and um, she is not wanting to continue a pregnancy with a fetus that has some genetic chromosome abnormalities. 
So after namiocentesis, we are on the lookout, of course, for infection, and we are on the lookout for um, uh, preterm labor. So uh, most women will, will be watched very closely for that. Ultrasound, uh, there are all kinds of ultrasounds that can happen nowadays um, that you see what they call a convenience ultrasound, meaning uh, they just want to see pictures of the baby's face. This is an example of a 4D ultrasound. You can see these babies pretty well. In the, in the, I think this is computer enhanced just a bit. Um, but a lot of people are doing ultrasounds just for fun, just to get a look. Of course, people want to know what, what gender they're having and um, ultrasound is they've gotten pretty good at, at determining gender although i still see where occasionally they're wrong and um, people are quite surprised when sophie comes out with the penis and uh, uh, they're very disturbed that we told them the wrong gender the only true way of knowing what the gender is is amniocentesis where they can look at the chromosomes and tell whether it's xx or xy so some of the other things that we can do is a chorionic villi sampling that's done very early on um, and percutaneous umbilical blood sampling. Most of these, again, I don't see very often. This has either happened by the time they get to us in labor and delivery or we don't use them locally. Um, but we do see these non-stress test is when we bring a woman in and put her on the monitor and look for some, some specific characteristics of the fetal heart rate, we're doing what's called a non-stress test. A contraction stress test is when we actually cause contractions by giving medications like Pitocin. And then um, we look at how well the baby is tolerating that based on the fetal monitor. And we're gonna talk more about fetal monitoring, so I'm not gonna go into that right now, but, um, it, contraction stress test, I've, I've actually done it once in my entire career. I don't see it very often, but NCLEX and ATI loves that question. And a biophysical profile. This is something that we use pretty frequently. This is when we bring the baby or bring the mom in and they do an ultrasound along with a non-stress test and they give the baby a score. And this is telling us how well the baby is tolerating what's happening in the uterus. So a BPP uh, is what you hear that term. And um, I have another slide I'll talk about it in a minute. So here for the non-stress test, this is when we put the mom on the fetal monitor. This is usually done as we are reaching viability. So 20 to 24 weeks or on, we can do a non-stress test. They tell us officially we can't um, have a positive non-stress test until they're 28 weeks, but what we're looking at, so down here is our contraction pattern and up here is our baby. And again, I'm gonna go into more depth than this in another lecture, but we're looking for things like variability, which is that beat to beat change of the heart rate and accelerations in the heart rate. We're also looking to see if there's any decelerations, there's none here. But uh, uh, in order to have what we call a reactive non-stress test, which is what we want, that would be the, the desired outcome, we need at least two accelerations in a 15-minute strip and moderate variability in heart rate in a normal range. So when we have a woman come into the hospital and we put them on the monitor, essentially we're doing a non-stress test to see how well the baby is tolerating what's going on on the inside. And we're going to talk more about this later. Here's our biophysical profile. So when they're doing the ultrasound along with the non-stress test, they're looking at um, these additional things. So non-stress test plus is there fetal breathing movement, is there fetal movement, fetal tone, and amniotic fluid amount. And so we get a score and um, these scores tell us whether it is, uh, it, that the, if the baby is tolerating what's happening or if we need to intervene either by additional monitoring or by um, uh, inducing labor because the baby would be better off on the outside. Um, so with your biophysical profile, uh, I do want to mention here anything, uh, so you, the, the total possible score is a 10. In some facilities, local facilities, they leave the non-stress test part to the labor and delivery nurses and the ultrasound techs don't do that part. So the highest score will be an eight because they take those two points off. But anything six or more is considered normal. Anything six or below is considered abnormal. Anything under four 
is um, immediate intervention. So um, knowing those scores uh, and those values, what they mean are very important. Some of the first trimester discomforts we can see, urinary frequency, fatigue, nausea, vomiting, breast tenderness, remember those are all probable or, uh, uh, um, sorry, presumptive signs of pregnancy, not, not um, uh, positive, but we do see these, they're, they're frequent. So you have to know what's normal in order to know what's not normal. Um, all the first trimester discomforts listed here are considered normal and common. Um, sometimes they can become extreme. So for instance, if mom has um, extreme bleeding gums or nosebleeds, that can increase her chance of being anemic. So we, she already has the anemia of pregnancy or physiological anemia. So we need to try to help her um, by keeping the, her mucous membranes moistened so that she has less um, uh, nosebleeds so that she doesn't become more anemic. And then watching those cravings to make sure that she's not eating anything that's going to harm her. Um, but these are all our first trimester discomforts and your patients will ask you about them. And there's everything under the sun trying to um, alleviate them. All kinds of, of remedies that they will come up with. And this is why it's important for you to know how to find evidence-based practice so that you can give them good information. Second trimester dif discomforts um, come along backache, and is it normal pregnancy backache, or is it backache that's coming and going that could be a signal of preterm contraction? So we want to make sure that we know what's normal in order to catch what's not normal. Varicosities, again, we want to be very careful about um, varicosities of the vulva and legs. Using compression stockings, super important for moms or um, and nurses too. I'm going to throw that out there. If you want to avoid varicosities, you want to start wearing your compression socks. And yes, they're expensive, but they last a long time. Um, hemorrhoids and and looking for ways to alleviate those, making sure that she's keeping her um, bowels moving very frequently. Lots of fiber, fresh fruits and vegetables will help that. And then having more gas and bloating, having heartburn, having um, uh, other issues that um, come along with eating that full meal. As the baby starts to grow, we tell them to eat five smaller meals throughout the day rather than her three large meals or, or three smaller meals and several snacks. So second trimester discomforts. And then this picture I've brought here, I have another one to show you. This is actually what we call vena cava syndrome. So as this uterus starts to grow and women lay flat on their back, their baby puts pressure on this vena cava, which controls blood flow back to the heart to, for the mother. And so if you're cutting off blood supply for the mother, she's going to start feeling lightheaded, dizzy, nauseous, um, just general uh, um, not, not feeling well and babies don't like it when the blood supply is cut off to the mother. So we recommend women don't lay on their back in their second trimester on. We don't ever want them flat on their back. Just merely putting a pillow or a rolled up towel or some sort of wedge under their hip just a little bit when they're laying on their um, backs or sitting in bed even semi-fowler is enough to get the baby off that vena cava and it's super important and like i said i have another um, vena cava syndrome picture here so you want to and this goes for every department if you're working in the er if you're working in um, ambulance if you're working in a clinic doctor's office med surge we don't want our moms laying flat on their back because they will have um, a hypotension and babies do not do well when mom has hypotension. So uh, important that we don't have them laying flat on their back. Third trimester discomforts, as we're moving on through the pregnancy, um, return of a lot of the first trimester discomforts because now the baby is moving down into that pelvis. They may have shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, uh, increased heartburn, dependent edema, this is when um, women, pregnant women will third space their extra fluid, and so they will definitely have some dependent edema. We want to know what's normal in order to know what's not normal. So we're watching if she has extreme edema on her lower extremities or even her upper extremities or around her face. That could be a sign that she's moving into a preeclamptic state. We'll talk more about that later, but these are um, 
why it's important for us to know what's normal so that we can pick out what's not normal. And then she will start having more of those Braxton Hicks contractions, those practice contractions. If you listen to any part of this lecture, this is the most important part. It's important for you as nurses, no matter what area you're working in, and it's important for you as people that will be having babies. Um, and it's important for you as friends and family member of people that will be having babies. These are warning signs in pregnancy. If any of these signs appear, medical attention needs to be sought. And by the end of this course, by the end of this eight weeks, you will understand why these are warning signs. But for now, I just want you to know what they are. Visual disturbances, headache, edema, rapid weight gain. Those all go with one specific disease process, and we'll talk more about it later. Pain, as in pain that doesn't go away. Pain is a signal to us that something's going on. So it could be epigastric pain. It could be uh, back pain that comes and goes. It could be pain in um, um, lower, down low where the uh, cervix is. So if it's constant pain, we need to investigate what's going on. It could be pain in the back where the kidneys are. Maybe there's infection or, or um, kidney stones. Signs of infection, I mentioned some of those. A fever of 100.4 or more, a rapid pulse, a rapid respiration. Those, can, those go for moms as well as babies. Um, other signs of infection, foul smell, discharge, leaking, all of those are signs. So these are, this is warning signs in pregnancy that need attention. We don't wait for the next doctor's appointment. We go and seek help either in urgent care or a hospital or a birth center. Vaginal bleeding or drainage, persistent vomiting, muscular irritability or convulsions, and absence or decreased in fetal movement once felt. If we were, have been feeling our babies move and now we aren't, that is a huge sign that whatever's going on in there, the baby is conserving energy and is under stress. That's the first thing they will do is stop their large muscle movements. So if we are not feeling our baby move, we need to get to a facility that can um, look at our baby, do a non-stress test or a biophysical profile, and make sure that our baby is tolerating what's happening in the uterus. So warning signs in pregnancy, you need to know these. And then our education. A lot of what we do in our prenatal care is education. Um, talking about personal hygiene, wiping the correct way, not getting in a hot tub sauna, uh, perineal care, the importance of dental care and prevention of preterm labor, breast care, there's nothing specific we have to do. Um, sometimes women will be given advice to, quote, toughen up their nipples or get their babies ready, or get their nipples ready for breastfeeding. None of that needs to happen. That just causes tissue damage. Looking at clothing, a lot of women don't want to buy maternity clothes, so they'll try to squeeze into their regular clothing. But if we're wearing very restrictive clothing, we want to be careful that we're not actually restricting fetal development and fetal growth. Exercise, if they were extreme um, athlete before they were pregnant, they can continue on as long as um, there's no issues with the pregnancy. But if they were not an extreme athlete before pregnancy, pregnancy is not the time to begin that. Um, sleep and rest, making sure that they're getting adequate amounts of sleep. Most people uh, are more tired during pregnancy because after all, they are growing a human um, and, it's, and it's hard work, both mentally and physically, um, but making sure that they're getting enough sleep and rest is important. Sexual activity, talking about what's normal, what's common, what's okay, employment, travel, things like um, infections, uh, picking up things like Zika, even though we know it's already here in the United States. And then looking at our immunizations. Uh, several of our immunizations, we know that if we give a woman a Tdap vaccine during pregnancy, which she can have a modified live, uh, uh, a non-live vaccine. So any vaccine that is modified live or non-live, she can have during pregnancy. So flu and Tdap are two of those. Um, uh, measles, mumps, and rubella, MMR, is live, so we cannot give that to her during pregnancy. It has to happen afterwards. Um, but the ones that we can give during pregnancy, we know that some of that immunity is referred to the baby. So pertussis is one of the reasons that we would give Tdap 
And pertussis is an infection that um, can be very severe in newborns and young babies, and they cannot get their own vaccine until um, they're much older. So to protect them, there's some referred immunity that comes from mom. So they're recommending that women get a Tdap vaccine in pregnancy in the third trimester to give some of that referred immunity to the baby uh, in those early months. Um, same with flu. We want to make sure that these women are keeping up with their vaccines in order to protect their babies. It's not always about the mom. Sometimes it's about the baby. And let's see here. Preparation for labor, birth, and beyond. There's lots of different methods out there. I'm not going to ask you to memorize all of them or know the different um, ideologies behind them. I just want you to be familiar with some of the terms because you may see this in either your testing or people will ask you about them. But basically getting ready for labor and birth is knowing what to expect, knowing what's normal so they can pick out what's not normal. And then there's all kinds of um, ideas that go into childbirth, whether medications are appropriate to use or not, whether they want to um, uh, have lots of intervention or low, or low intervention. And this, these decisions are really meant to help prepare them to begin this process of parenthood where lots of decisions will have to be made. So I always recommend that women get good quality information from good quality sources. And I've put a lot of these sources in my extra resource section for those of you that are thinking about having babies or know women that are having babies or that want to be labor and delivery nurses. There's, there's, you could spend a long time learning all these different methods. As a childbirth educator, I, um, over the years, I have spent a lot of um, energy in learning the different methods. And what I found is they all have just a little bit different ideology and every woman has to figure out for herself what works for her and what her thoughts are about this. I always tell women that I'm helping to take care of, it, what works is what, is what works for you. It doesn't matter what I did. It doesn't matter what my um, uh, ideology, ideas about childbirth was. I got to do it my way and now you get to do it yours. And so I never influenced them with um, what my choices were. I just give them education and let them make their choices. So we have Lamaz, which is really a focus on breathing and relaxation techniques. And there is a Lamaz certified coach here in Bakersfield at the Nesting Company. And those um, nurtured birth, childbirth classes are available. Bradley is a focus on exercises, again, and slow controlled abdominal breathing. You'll call this husband coached or partner coach childbirth. The um, Dick Reed is the idea of um, distraction techniques where uh, we don't focus on the fear, we focus on the knowledge of what's happening with their body and kind of going with that process. Hypno babies, a uh, fantastic approach, self hypnosis. It can't, it needs to be started earlier on in the pregnancy. It requires some practice to do. A lot of um, people refer to this now as kind of mindfulness and, and, um, uh, uh, self-hypnosis and meditation, those kind of all go along the same lines, but hypnobabies is very effective. The women that I've seen that work with, that do hypnobabies have um, very effective pain control methods uh, just within their own mind. And then spinning babies is a hot topic in the labor and delivery world right now. Spinning babies is looking at it from a physiological point of view and helping mom get into the positions that is going to help this baby get into the most optimal position for delivery. And labor and delivery nurses that have been doing this for many, many years, myself included, are learning new things about um, uh, maternal physiology and how it is the utmost importance in getting this baby into the uh, appropriate position. So some of the other topics that we see in childbirth education, the physiology of labor, like what is actually going on, what is happening. A lot of what I'm going to teach you is what we would teach to women in childbirth education. Uh, the physiology of birth, pain management, coping techniques, the hospital routine, where, when to register, when to come, what to expect, what do we provide? What do we not provide? Um, other courses that, that can be offered from hospitals, breastfeeding, uh, baby basics, so some, some um, 
uh, diapering, comforting, bathing. Sometimes you'll see CPR offered. Um, and then usually there's some sort of a hospital tour and these can be combined. Uh, all of our hospitals in town have a little bit different method, but the main point is that women need to get some education before childbirth, it, whether they do it online, whether they get on YouTube, whether they purchase a, a product, there needs to be some preparation and you will be shocked and dismayed at the women that come in and have absolutely no idea what's going on with their bodies and no idea what's happening with their babies um, because they have done no preparation. And then other things that we see, feeding choices, we need to talk about breastfeeding and the advantages. Um, we need to talk about bottle feeding, the advantages and disadvantages that come along with that. Um, uh, and then just that final preparation, when, what do they want for their deliveries? We see, do see people come in with birth plans and those need to be respected and um, looked at by both the physician and the nurse taking care of them. Women have choice and as we move further into this new decade, I hope that um, we see uh, more acceptance of women's choices and women become more educated about what's available to them. In, in labor and delivery, we've been doing things status quo for a long time and um, the tide is changing. And we need to, if we're going to provide evidence-based care, that's what we need to do is provide evidence-based care. And as more women become uh, more educated about it, uh, we need to be willing to listen to what it is they want. After all, this is their bodies and they've hired us to accompany them. And then that breastfed baby, um, just a little bit about breastfeeding. I'm not going to spend much time here. But when we are talking about breast milk versus formula, for many years, we talked about them as if they were equal. And we now know there's evidence to support everything I'm about to say. Breast milk is uh, superior in all ways to formula. If a woman cannot produce breast milk, if there's a specific reason that she cannot give her breast milk to her baby, there are many donors available out there. There are milk banks that we can have donor breast milk. In fact, almost all of our NICU babies in town do get donor breast milk um, because we know it's like a medicine to them. So when we, I, the tide has changed and we definitely see the importance of um, breast milk. Obviously, if it's just not a possibility for a baby to receive it, we do have clean water and a good resource in formula, but it is unfair for us to give the education to women that those two things are equal. Yes, your baby will thrive on formula, but breast milk is milk made for human babies. And if at all possible, whether it comes from the mother, comes from the donor, we need to try to get human milk into human babies. That's it for this lesson. If you have any questions, you know where to reach me.